Are American troops engaged in some sort of war games or training or practice or advising or something with respect to Taiwanese troops on an island or islands off the coast of Taiwan? Yes. Uh, it's quite important to emphasize that in February of this year, uh, we decided that we would permanently station troops, uh, not large numbers, but small numbers of troops in Taiwan uh, that are tasked with training the Taiwanese. Uh, and uh, some of those troops, it appears, are on these two islands, uh, Kinmen and Pengju, uh, that are very close to the Chinese mainland. They're in effect between Taiwan uh, and the Chinese mainland. Uh, and those troops are engaging, those American troops are engaging in training the Taiwanese. And what are they... I mean, they're doing this under the under the nose and in the shadow of uh, of the mainland. Uh, what are they training the Taiwanese for to interact with American troops? Should the mainland invade and a president of the United States be crazy enough to send American troops there to defend Taiwan in the face of the one China policy? I don't get this. Well, I, I think what's going on here is we are sending a signal to the Chinese that we will defend Taiwan. I mean, this is a tripwire force. Uh, it's hard to figure out exactly what the numbers are. Uh, I would guess the number will be somewhere between 100 and 200 American troops, maybe a little larger, maybe a little smaller. But it's not a force that's going to be able to fend off a Chinese amphibious assault against the Taiwan Strait at some point down the road. What it's designed to do is serve as a tripwire and bring us into any war that breaks out over Taiwan. All right, to and be then, clear, by tripwire, you mean these people are sitting ducks, and if they are attacked, that's the American justification for sending massive numbers of troops there to retaliate against the attackers. That's one way of looking at it, but I would put a slightly different spin on it. And I would argue that what the administration is doing is simply sending a signal to the Chinese that we are going to defend Taiwan. And therefore, you better not invade Taiwan because it will involve a great power war between the United States and China. Wow. Well. How much longer is this going to go on? I mean, is this intentional provocation, Professor Mearsheimer? What you want to think about this is to ask yourself a simple question. You're dealing with a country, China, that is not a status quo power. It wants to take Taiwan back. It wants to turn the South China Sea into a giant Chinese lake. And it basically believes it should control the East China Sea and those small islands that the Japanese now control in the East China Sea. And do you, as an American, think we have a vested interest in preventing China from doing any of those things? Or do you think that we should just stand back and allow China to take Taiwan, to dominate the South China Sea, and to dominate the East China Sea? Where you come down on that question determines how you think about troops in Taiwan or American naval forces in the South China Sea, or what have you. Does China want to invade the United States or trade with the United States? It absolutely does not want to invade the United States. But the question is, should the United States allow China to dominate Asia? Should the United States allow China to take Taiwan and to dominate the East China Sea and the South China Sea? You have to have an answer to that. And the same argument applies to past historical cases like Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, Imperial Germany, and Imperial Japan. Do you think it mattered whether those countries dominated either Europe or Asia. In the past, we have decided that we cannot allow a Germany or a Japan or the Soviet Union to dominate one of those two regions, that's Asia or Europe. And that basic question is at play here. 
with regard to East Asia and China today. If you don't believe that we should care whether China dominates Asia, then we shouldn't fight for Taiwan or for the South China Sea. But if you think otherwise, then you have to think about clever ways to deter China. China, it's very important to understand, is not a status quo power in East Asia. It's a revisionist power. It's the United States that wants to maintain the status quo in East Asia for obvious reasons. We're the top dog. The Chinese don't like the fact that we're the top dog in their backyard, and they want to change that situation. Who can blame them? But we are bent on preventing them from doing that. Now, you could argue that we shouldn't care one way or the other. But if you do care, that explains a lot about what's going on in East Asia today. Here's uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, Kurt Campbell on what he calls, Professor Mearsheimer, I need you to comment on this, Beijing adventurism. If there is a lesson that is drawn that it is acceptable or achievable that a big nation can invade a smaller one, um, that the lesson of that can be um, easily uh, uh, undertaken uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And every country uh, in the Indo-Pacific wants uh, very much to make clear that, that what has been undertaken in Ukraine cannot be successful so that no one contemplates that in, uh, in the capitals in, P in Pyongyang or in, um, uh, in uh, Beijing as they think about uh, potential adventure, adventurism. What do you mean by adventurism? What you're talking about? Uh, dominance in East Asia and elimination uh, of Western powers? Look, my view is that from China's point of view, it makes eminently good strategic sense to want to dominate East Asia and to push the Americans out of East Asia. I would not call this adventurism. It's good strategic logic, in my opinion. He, on the other hand, has a vested interest in portraying the Chinese and their behavior in a negative light. So he calls it adventurism. He wouldn't call the American invasion of Iraq adventurism or the American war against Serbia as adventurism. He would argue there was a good strategic reason for those two conflicts and for us initiating those conflicts. So this is a word game here that's designed to make the Chinese look bad and make us look good. If Joe Biden called you up tomorrow, and we know he won't, and <laughs> said, John, uh, should I send more troops to uh, those islands outside of Taiwan or should I bring them home? What would you tell them? I would tell them to keep the troops there. Uh, I, I would uh, go to great lengths to prevent China from dominating Asia. I've argued that for a long time. Uh, for the same reason, I think it was good that the United States played a key role in preventing Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union from dominating either Europe or Asia. I think it's in our interest not to allow that to happen. So I'm in favor of preventing China, if we can, from conquering Taiwan, dominating the South China Sea and the East China Sea. I want to do it in a smart way. I don't want to do it in a provocative way. I certainly want to avoid a war between the United States and China. But I do believe it's in our strategic interest to contain China. Wouldn't a war between the United States and China then be inevitable uh, if China invades Taiwan and there's 100,000 Marines there defending it? Well, I think if China were to invade Taiwan, we would have a war between the United States uh, and uh, China. There's no question about that. You want to remember that President Biden has said on four separate occasions that the United States would come to the defense of Taiwan if the Chinese invaded. Uh, and I mean, President Biden sometimes says things without thinking, but the mere fact that he has made that controversial argument, and it is a controversial argument, uh, as our conversation shows, four separate times tells you that he means business. And I, I believe, by the way, that given Biden's comments, given the fact that we are now permanently stationing small 
numbers of troops in Taiwan, the Chinese understand full well that if they invade Taiwan, it will mean war with the United States. And I think that will go to great lengths to deter the Chinese from invading Taiwan, which I think is a good thing. You would think it would go to great lengths to deter the Americans from sending troops to Taiwan. You well, want to see missiles in San Francisco? Well, my question to you is, do you think that it matters whether we prevent China from dominating Asia? Do you that's, think that, that that's the value judgment which you've articulated uh, so nicely? But you have to ante up on that because right. it's easy for you to poke at me for wanting to defend Taiwan, right? But if you don't want to defend Taiwan, you are in effect saying that it is not of strategic importance whether China dominates Asia. That's right. a completely legitimate point of right. view. Right. And I and part of the reason I, I come to that conclusion is because of what my friend John Joseph Mearsheimer has said to me, that China does not want to invade San Francisco. They want to trade with us. I would just say to you that the argument that you're articulating is the heart and soul of the isolationist argument in the United States throughout much of the 20th century. And it is a powerful argument. I do not for one second want to make fun of the argument that you're making. I disagree with it, but it is a powerful argument. And it's why Franklin D. Roosevelt had an enormously difficult time defeating the isolationists in the late 30s and early 40s, because people were making an argument very similar to yours. Right. And again, it is a very powerful argument. I uh, See, I would, I would rephrase that and say it's why Franklin D. Roosevelt looked the other way on December 7th, 1941, because he needed that to defeat the isolationist argument. But we're, we're talking about, you know, 80 years ago. Yes, but that 80 years ago is very relevant for the present. Yes. Because yes. one could argue your argument that you're making now is stronger today than it was in the late 1930s yes. because we have nuclear weapons. Yes. Remember, we didn't have nuclear weapons in the late, late 1930s. So one could argue that San Francisco, to use your rhetoric, is safer today because of the American nuclear deterrent than it was in the late 1930s. Nicely put. Professor, it is a delight to uh, to chat with you. I never thought we'd disagree on anything, but uh, the respect you have for my argument and the respect I have for yours and your intellect and your experience uh, is uh, very high. Uh, but thank you very much for all you have uh, analyzed for us uh, today, from uh, Gaza to uh, Iran to Ukraine to Beijing to Taipei. Thank you, Professor Mayor Sharma. It's a pleasure. Look forward to already. Look forward to seeing you next week. You're welcome, Judge. Thank you. Um, a brilliant and gifted human being. Coming up at four o'clock Eastern, the one and only Max Blumenthal, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom. <laughs>